Okay, so I think we're going. Hi, I'm Penny Kittle. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Gallagher. So we decided that we are going to do a little PD for teachers. Um, what we're going to do is talk about books and writing and our thinking um, every day for a while. And these will probably be about 30 minute videos, do you think, Kelly? Maybe it's 1130 this morning. Well, we'll find out. We haven't done that. <laughs> and, and then we will um, set up a flip grid where teachers who want to could respond with their own thinking. I think we could all really grow together as a community of educators kind of marooned at home um, during this time of incredible catastrophe in our country and around the world. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I, I'm intrigued by this idea of trying to remain, you know, in a professional community. I know that everybody who's probably watching this uh, has experienced incredible amount of stress uh, and anxiety over the last week. Uh, things changed almost hourly. I mean, that last week seemed like a month in time. And I know as, you know, as we were shifting towards our schools closing, um, I found a real comfort in um, in connecting with members of my own English department. Like we're pretty close and we've had this community in which we've been sharing thinking and ideas and where should we go from here? And I, I don't know, I found a real comfort in that. So uh, hence this idea of perhaps a little bit bigger community, uh, but of teachers kind of working our way through these times of truly unprecedented. Yeah, I was thinking this morning um, when the kind of plan went out for what your kids could do in their home, your students, that so many teachers responded. And I felt like it was more than thank you for your thinking about what to do, but thank you for reaching out. There were a lot of messages that uh, mentions that I got on Twitter that were just about compassion and kindness. And, and you could sense this idea that teachers want to be together. And so I thought if you and I could work through some of the thinking and things we're doing as readers, writers, thinkers, and perhaps help teachers connect with each other, you know, our vision that teachers find colleagues across the world or the country to do book clubs with could possibly happen from this community. Yeah, and, and I agree. And this is, this is unscripted and in real time, too, because I received uh, an email from my principal this morning basically saying, don't get started with heavy assignments yet. And I mean, I think that in itself is an interesting issue, is this idea of what kinds of things should we be having kids do at home? And, and then that uh, lesson plan and some of the texts that you and I have sent out, you know, we kind of get into the idea, this is not the time uh, to drill and kill, you know, on whatever that core novel is that they're working. This is a time that kids are living through a monumental historical event, something that they will be talking to with their kids and their grandkids someday. And, yeah. you know, we want our kids to capture this moment in time. And uh, as you and I are going to share here today, we want the teachers to capture this time and that you and I have begun writing in our own notebooks um, and that, you know, this gets along that idea that we've always talked about, that we don't just assign the work, we actually kind of do the work with, with the kids, alongside the kids. And so uh, you and I are going to do that, and we're going to share uh, this really with other teachers out in the world. And as this unfolds in real time, we'll kind of maybe track how our thinking is unfolding in real time. Yeah, I like, I like that a lot. Um, so... This is how I thought we could start. Um, recently, Tom Romano sent out an email to several of us with quotes from Anne Lamott's book, Stitches, A Handbook of Meaning, Hope, and Repair from 2013. And I just excerpted certain lines from it that I wanted to throw together in the kind of the purpose of what we're doing here. Where do we even begin in the presence of evil or catastrophe? We work hard, we enjoy life as we can, we endure. We try to help ourselves and one another. We look for solace in nature and art. To me, teaching is a holy calling. It's the gift not only of not giving up on people, but of even figuring out where to begin. You start wherever you can. You find one place in the cloth through which to take one stitch, one simple stitch. Nothing fancy, 
just one that's strong and true. And I, when I was reading it this morning, I thought, that's all we're going to try to do here is just take one stitch, one possible opening for talk. So I wanted to start with book talks, just like we do in class. Tell me what you've been reading. Um, I'm about halfway through Lucy Cockin's new book called Teaching Writing. Woohoo! Uh, I have it on my desk. <laughs> that was not planned, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, and of course, uh, anytime Lucy comes out with a new book, I'm going to read it, given her stature and given her history uh, and influence on the teaching of reading and writing in this country. Uh, I found it to be, in the I've only read the first half, um, I have found it to be um, a really good sort of uh, reminder that there's a big difference between assigning writing and teaching writing. Uh, and um, even though the book is written, I think, for teachers of uh, younger kids than I teach, I'm a high school teacher, I think this book is primarily written through the lens of elementary school teaching. I think it's really, really relevant to what goes on in my 12th grade classroom as far as giving kids space, giving kids autonomy, giving kids uh, choice, um, and where the teacher's role is in that, in that process, and the idea of uh, shouldering up with kids as they're writing, and, and not hovering and not drowning them in assessment, uh, but uh, moving more into a coaching mode. And I know many people who have watched or watching this are familiar with the writing process, but I, I think it's a good, for those of us who are familiar, I think it's a good reminder of certain moves here and there. And for those who are just entering the profession, I think it's essential reading. Nice. I've only read the introduction, um, the story of her work with Don Graves. It was profoundly moving to me. I read it on the website, which is why I had to buy a copy of the book. Um, and then I got to spend an evening with Lucy just last, a week ago, two weeks ago, um, at Teachers College and we had dinner and she talked about how important this book is to her. So I'm so glad that was your choice. Yeah, yeah. So, so what do you read? Um, so I'm uh, two thirds of the way finished with Stamped. And this book I've been so waiting for, I'd pre-ordered it and two copies came because I got one for my daughter who's home um, because her schools are closed. She's in her first year of teaching, which um, was really moving. I said to her, um, you know, I saw on the news today that kids may not go back at all this year. And she just got, you know, kind of caught up. She said, but I haven't even said goodbye to them. You know, that first time, the first year of teaching. And I was so like, I remember crying as I left my third graders in California and got in the car to drive to Oregon, knowing I'd never see 95% of them ever again. That sense of letting this be the end before you knew it was the end. So she has a copy and I have a copy. And what I think is so profound about this book, um, I had, I'm gonna say this wrong too. Is it Ibram X. Kendi? I'm not sure. Ibram? Ibram X. Kendi? But stamped from the beginning, won the Pulitzer Prize, and I have been reading that. But this is stamped for middle and high school kids with Jason Reynolds as the, it's almost like the voice for his work because he's a researcher and it's an incredible book, but it's really dense. So one of the things I love about this is um, it's even called at the bottom a remix of the National Book Award winning, sorry, not Pulitzer Prize, National Book Award winning stamp from the beginning. But it's such an accessible book. And I realize because I'm way farther in this than I am in the other one. And he takes this kind of summary of American history through the lens of anti-racism and says, this is where it came from. This is the roots of all of the things we've believed and thought about and lived and how ignorant I am of so many things. He'll quote people that I have quoted in my life not knowing actually who they really were. So mm. I just wanna give a sense of the voice of this text because it's so Jason Reynolds. Um, uh, um, okay, speaking of books, in Samuel Morton's Crania, I can't even pronounce it, Egypti, Egyptiaca, I don't know. He introduced the narrative that historically, you're laughing at me, there was a white Egypt that had black slaves. Who knew? The answer is no one, not even Egyptians. The propaganda just kept coming. Anything to justify supremacy and slavery. And if bunk literature and false studies were the breakbeats of racism, 
Just listen to that, the bees, as if bunk literature and false studies were the breakbeats of racism, looped samples pulsing on and on. Then John C. Calhoun, a senator from South Carolina, was the MC for slavery, an effective one, there to mm. rock the racist crowd. Mm. I just love that. You know, there's spirit and movement and poetry in Jason Reynolds always, mm -hmm. but now you've got it as you try to interpret and think about the history you were taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw a social studies teacher tweeted this morning that this should be required reading in social studies classes. Um, imagine what that would do to transform mm -hmm. things. And there's a teacher's guide for Stamped written by Sonia Cherry Paul that is widely published and another teacher's guide, I think it's on School Library Journal by Julia Torres, the um, Denver librarian. So there's lots mm -hmm. of resources to think about this book with kids. You know, you hate to, hate to use a word like opportunity in a time like this when so many people are suffering. Um, but I guess that there is a very thin silver lining is that this is going to free up reading time uh, for us as professional teachers uh, in reading both books like that where you might take it into the classroom and books like Lucy's book, which are going to make me uh, a better teacher. Uh, it's interesting. I've you know, I've run a faculty book club for 27 years at my high school, and I've found it that as the world gets more complicated, I'm having trouble getting teachers to read the books now who voluntarily want to be in book clubs because life is just so demanding and teaching is so demanding. And so, of course, we wish none of this was happening, but I, I guess one of the positives that will come out of it is that we'll, we'll find some good time to read. So I look forward to having kind of daily book talks with you and, and suggesting other things that uh, might work in our classroom or might advance our uh, professional craft. Yeah, yeah, so true. So the second thing we were going to talk about was notebook writing, because in the plan that was sent out, the idea that you and I talked quite a bit about, about just keeping a record of this time in history. And I used to say to my students at the end of every school year, um, take this notebook that you think um, is somewhat childish because you're a year older now, you know, at the end of a school year, but put it in the bottom of your closet and give it to yourself 10 years from now, a gift you save, right. give yourself, who were you that year? Right. Um, as we were looking at, you know, Anne Frank's diary and Zlata's diary and really thinking about people could go back and look at the specifics of this time in history through the notes that we collect. So I was hoping you'd talk about what did you write in your notebook today, the 16th of March, and then I will talk about mine. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanna just piggyback on that a little bit and say I think sometimes people are living through like really important history without recognizing this is the moment of really important history. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, in that lesson plan that we created, you know, we're, we're encouraging kids to do daily writing like we're gonna share at this point in time, but maybe also scrapbooking or maybe art. You know, it's gonna be very interesting to see the creative impulse that comes out of a worldwide event yeah. like this over the next few months. And I think one way for our kids to kind of express their concerns and kind of work through um, the stresses that they're experience is, experiencing is to is to write about it, is to draw about it, is to, it, it is not to go do packet work. It is not to, you know, uh, go to spark notes and do that kind of work the kids have become very adept at doing, but to give them a, a place to be able to to really express what, what they're going through. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, I, I wanna say to my kids that, you, the writing that you're doing, this is your history and you need to capture it, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the writing you're doing today, I, I think would, would be really, really interesting to read 10, 20, 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, uh, my first passage, um, I'll read the first line. Uh, I wrote this this morning. Today I'm worried about two things, my father-in-law and my hair. So um, I'd be worried about your hair too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't, um, I don't, yeah, that seems kind of lame, but that's just a line that came to me when I woke up this morning. I'm worried about my father-in-law because he's 95 years old. He's in a skilled nursing home because uh, this is another story for another day, but uh, 
even though he has congestive heart failure, uh, he was recently uh, given a pacemaker. And uh, so he's convalescing in a skilled nursing home. And uh, that nursing home, uh, not surprisingly, has now cut off all visitors. Has uh, So he's sitting there, you know, 95 years old. He's in failing health. He's by himself. And yes, we can call him and do that kind of work with him. Uh, so the, the passage that I wrote this morning is really about our life is going to change in big ways and our life is going to change in small ways. And so I wrote about one big way, uh, not being able to have that personal or physical or in-person connection with him. And then the second way is, you know, my wife and I were having this conversation at breakfast. It's time for me to go get a haircut. And as you know, Penny, I can be a little OCD. So, you know, my person who's cut my, yeah, now go ahead and laugh at me. <laughs> my person is, I've had the same person cut my hair for 30 years. And it's the fourth Sunday of every, every fourth Sunday at the exact same time. And so yesterday I didn't go. Um, I'm taking the uh, notion of social distancing yeah. very, very, you know, to heart. Um, and so I wrote about, yeah, it's stupid. It's a little thing, but I think we're going to be surprised on how many little things are going to shift and some of them may become big things. And then I didn't finish writing it, but I also wanted to write a little bit about, you know, how in this time, for those of us who are, uh, capable, uh, even though I didn't go, I'm still paying her and I'm paying the gardener and I'm paying, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, I'm trying to, you know, the people who are in the service industry, um, I, you know, I'm trying to keep, keep them, you know, afloat. And so uh, that's kind of, you know, I kind of started getting into the economics of it a little bit too. Like, I, who knows where that's going to go. But anyways, uh, that's sort of the gist of my piece this morning uh, about being worried about my father-in-law and my hair. What I think, you? Um, how long did you write? I wrote for about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. I, and uh, I'm going to pause for a minute to watch your visceral reaction to this, but I didn't actually write it in my notebook. I, I typed it. And yeah, I know. I know that's really hard for you. But the reason I did that, and no. this, this raises a bigger issue, though. I think the, the reason I did that is I want to share it with my kids. And so I'm going to post my daily writing with my kids. And what I'm going to do is print it and glue it into my notebook. Uh, so that I have a place where I can go back and find them all. But um, you and I have talked about this for years and, and got into this big time in 180 days. But we want the kids to see us wrestle, us thinking about, you know, this is, this is an un unsettling time for us as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, because I'm going to create a digital space for my young readers and my young writers to, to share, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to do a lot of this drafting um, on the computer, although I, could, I guess I could write it in my book and photograph it, but I think it's a little easier for them to see if it's in a Google Doc. Yeah, I wonder if you'll do some combination of both, because if I were posting this for my students, I would be wrestling with that. But since they saw me write under the doc camera in my handwritten notebook every day, it would feel more real. But I also think that as you go on, as we go on this journey of the next few weeks, how you and yourself might do art. I know, watch that face when I say that. You might, you might get out the colored pencils. And you know, I actually had the thought that, that if, I, if I had the courage to go into a bookstore, like I, I'd wanna buy, a, a, you know, both of us keep, keep notebooks. I like, I wanna start a new one uh, with this whole thing. Like it's, it's self, that's not mixed with all my notes from going to conferences and things, but it's, it's that. So maybe I'll order one on Amazon. So interesting. I um, have a whole bunch of them behind me because I'm never without extra blank notebooks for that emergency. Yeah. But here's the thing. I, um, in the opposite way, my notebooks are chronological. I can stay in one of these Moleskine ones for about three months and then I'm, I've filled it. And so I don't want a different notebook for this. The only things I've done different notebooks for are projects, big projects, like our 180 days project, which I didn't create its own notebook and it became hard to track because it takes years to write a book. But let so, me jump in. Pardon me? This is, let me jump in for a second. Isn't this not a big project? This oh. is, this no, is a standalone kind of thing. 
No, 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 no. I totally get that. But what I'm saying is this is a part of my history that I want to be in chronological order with the rest of my history. Oh instead of being like a book project was what I meant by yeah. project. Um, and you know what I love is though, it, every person who writes every day is gonna do it differently than the, the next person. Part of what we're trying to present here is that writers work in different ways. And I don't have any condemnation for someone who always puts their writing on a computer. I just know that I write very differently. I've studied yeah. it for so long and I know where um, a lot of the truest detail comes from is the slowing down in my notebook. So at any rate, I wrote- By the way, I, I agree with that. I wrote about that in the best interest of students, but it was just yeah. more of a, how am I gonna share it with my students? At least yeah. initially to kick off kind of consideration. Yeah, and I, um, this morning, so I find it kind of interesting that, um, as you know, the last thing I did before I flew um, out of Oklahoma, on Wednesday last week. I was there to present for three days and I left after the first day because you and I had presented in New York on Friday the 6th and that area had possibly a lot of coronavirus. We will never know, but because we found that out Wednesday morning and started texting, I left where I was um, and flew home. And the last thing I did Tuesday night was at Mabel Bassett Maximum Security Prison um, with the Poetic Justice Group. And so I have four or five pages of my memories of being with that group. Some of, I did that night while I was there, just kind of transcribing and other things were the next morning and then on the plane. And since then, so the next morning I wrote was Thursday morning. I um, haven't written hardly at all. And I know it's because of my own fear and trying to process what has been going on. I've been trying to do work on our book, but not the personal writing that really is in my notebook. So this morning when I sat down, um, I did the, I'm sitting on my couch in front of the fire, one of my favorite places to write besides here. And I put, Hannah comes downstairs in her wicked t-shirt, makes a bowl of yogurt, granola, fruit, all feels normal, but it isn't. We are 10 to 12 days from this. And this was according to the governor of New York. So I'm watching the news and I'm kind of just taking snippets. You need a pass on the street to be allowed to go anywhere in Italy. We have fewer hospital beds than they do. We have fewer ventilators than they do in Italy. And above all, they're letting people 70 and older die so they can take care of younger people with a better prognosis. And then I just wrote under that, things are accelerating so rapidly that a week or more from now, and it just goes dot, dot, dot. And I just started listing all of these things. And I think that one of the reasons I texted you about doing this was because I could feel myself getting overwhelmed. I've been overwhelmed, you know, like reading about it, but starting that sense that my husband runs a small business. He believes that they'll close their doors at the end of this week. Um, he's already has all kinds of measures in place, but the idea that we employ in the three sites, a lot of people that we have to keep, we have to pay their salaries. So there was this long list of worries and I immediately fell on the Hamilton line from a weekend ago when we saw Hamilton, who lives, who dies, who tells the story. Um, and from there, I wrote more just about how are we going to respond to the homeless right now? How are we going to learn to think beyond ourselves? Um, the middle class will collapse without jobs. What do we do to help our neighbors, our communities? And it was the, when I landed on that line communities, I thought, what about the professional community of teachers that you and I know? Is there something we can do to help them? And the only thing I would say about this writing is that lots, you know how you always say you got to uh, boil, what is it, whatever, how many gallons of tree sap to get one gallon of maple syrup? I think it's- I seven. live in Southern California. Yeah, you don't say that much there. We still have snow out there. <laughs> but- when you look at a notebook that's this full so far with writing, there's not much there that I glean out and use in like anything published or professional. It's a lot of writing like that that is just trying to get my head around my own thinking. And in this case, kind of naming what's bothering me so I can do better work, like get it out away from me. Which comes back again to the idea we touched on earlier that we believe this is the kind of writing kids should be doing. This is a very different kind of writing that goes on in a lot of English classes, which is usually very task oriented, very answer the teacher's kind of questions oriented. 
Um, but we feel, and we've talked about this, that the events that are unfolding are so significant that this is the way we think kids should process it. Now, I've also had a couple of tweets here and there saying, are you concerned at all about, um, you know, the, that it might be traumatic for children? We teach older kids, but might it be traumatic for them to, to swim in this daily? Um, I know how I think about that. What do you think about that? I think they're right. It will be traumatic for some kids to swim in this daily. Um, and I appreciate somebody noticing that, that part of the way I've always presented notebooks to my students is that any time I give you an idea or a prompt to get going, it's to help all of the students who don't know how to get started. And it's never meant to contain what's inside of you that you most want to say. And so if today instead I had sat here, I would be looking out at the snow and the woods in front of me in brilliant sunshine. And I would likely be writing about that because I usually do just mm -hmm. about how beautiful the world is. Um, and so I would never want students to feel that what we had written down was their only choice. And I don't know how well we communicated that and what was sent out, but, mm -hmm. um, you know how much I believe that kids should at times sit down and just sketch, you know, that if today your work is, you know, I've been collecting photographs of my mom and dad because my mom is in um, senior living. My dad died and a while ago, but still, you know, if that's what you want to focus on, grab a photograph, write more about it. I have a whole run of them across the top of one page that are all Maisie. What a surprise, my granddaughter. Um, or if my students instead wanted to, um, collect beautiful words. One of my favorite little things to do about a book that you're currently reading that you think is amazing, then I would hope they'd have other options, I guess is my point. Um, because I always want to protect them, um, protect the emotional cost of writing about what most is important. Yeah, my guess is that most kids are going to want to process it somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, are going to want to share their thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. The whole Graves thing about, you know, you have stories to tell that only you can tell. You know, who's watching your little brothers and sisters? Who's, who's watching a grandma, right? Um, how is it affecting your, your parents? And I, I, my sense is, is for most kids, that will be a way of helping them process it. But like you, too, I want to be sensitive to kids who who might indicate that today's not the day they feel like going there and, and having that freedom to deviate as we do in class all the time. You know, we, we don't want to be the person, you know, we've always, uh, you know, strive for this idea that kids get to an autonomy where they can, without a prompt or without a question that they can decide what they want to write about. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure how I would handle it if a kid said, I never want to write about it. Like, I, I think there needs to be some, I don't know. Uh, I, I think there needs to be some thinking about it. And not what's letting interesting is that you presented, um, I think between the two of us, very different ways to write about it. And so yeah. when I started listing those horrible things I was hearing on the news, that yeah. could be too traumatic for a kid to process. But when you listed... I'm in charge of taking care of my brothers and sisters and this is what they were doing today or I read them right. stories or that's a very personal way to process just life and I think that can be a beautiful record. Um, right. But I'm always, you remember Donna Salmon's classroom that I was just in, one of our favorite people in the world. She was showing her students um, Courtesy Corner, that mentor text found on a subway and what she said to introduce it was, Okay, so if you wanted to do this kind of writing, and you know I would never assign writing for your notebooks, and I thought that's really the message that we give kids. It's not an right. assignment. It's one way you can think about something or an opportunity. Right, right, right. That's, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, having that whole idea uh, put out in front that whatever you create, um, in a time like this is not going to be graded. It's, it's really a way of just kind of developing your desire to read and desire to write um, and, and to try to 
create conditions in which students are not worried about what grade I'm going to get on this particular, you know, endeavor. It seems weird to me to like grade somebody's reflection about how such an intense event is affecting his or her life, you know? Yeah. And I think that that idea of grading um, notebooks is such a tricky thing anyway, because what we really are trying to get kids to see it as a place to practice, a place to collect thinking, a place to play when you stand next to, you know, a great text and write in imitation of it. And so if you had a community of kids sharing, these are the things I've written about today, that community would inspire other kids to go, oh, I could write about that. Yeah. And that's yeah. bigger than something you and I can do in class. So maybe a topic for another a subsequent posting of one of these is maybe we just have a notebook talk one day. Yeah. Talk a little bit about what we've been doing in our notebooks. Yeah. Another Donna Salmon thing. She said to her kids as she was setting up the lesson, turn and tell somebody the story of your last five entries. And I was like, I don't do that enough. Right. Yeah. Loved it. So this is the end of uh, day one. Is that okay with you? Anything you wanted to close with? No, I think we're good. Okay, so our goal, our plan is to do these um, every day, five days a week, I think, Monday through Friday. We'll see if we can stick to it and what kinds of things crop up. But we are going to post these on YouTube and we are going to post them in our Twitter feeds, Facebook, um, for people to invite people to join us on Flipgrid. We'll make that public as well and um, see what happens. Thank you all for, for hanging with us today, and uh, we look forward to building a community of thinking and a community that's going to help us through these troubling times. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you.